Welcome to my talk on generalized proof of knowledge with fully dynamic setup. This is joint work with Christian Patercher and Wally Maurer. Let me start by giving you a brief recap of interactive proof systems and proof of knowledge in particular. So an interactive proof system is essentially um, a protocol between a prover P and a verifier V where the prover wants to convince the verifier V of some fact. In the case of a proof of knowledge, this fact is that for a given relation R and the statement X, the prover knows a witness W that satisfies the given relation. This notion has turned out to be one of the most influential and successful abstraction in cryptography and has a long history of formalization ultimately with the one by Velare and Goldreich from 1993 turning out to be the one that's nowadays accepted. However, throughout the years there have been quite a number of situations where it showed that despite being quite general with having this general um, relation R, proof of knowledge might not be general enough in certain applications. Especially, it might not be general enough when trying to formalize the goal of higher level applications. Let me give you some examples. For instance, consider password based authentication. There, a user wants to prove to a server that they know their password. Or consider proof of ownership in the, in, um, that's comes from client-side file-deed application. In the proof of ownership, a prover wants to prove to a server that they know the content of a certain file. So in both applications, it sounds like essentially a proof of knowledge. The prover wants to prove they know something. Yet, neither of those two applications could just be formalized using um, the common proof of knowledge formalization. Instead, both of those applications come with tailor-made um, security definitions that are um, entropy-based typically and often also fairly ad hoc. So let us briefly revisit like in which aspect the proof of knowledge might be more general and what has been done about this so far. So first, we observe that in the proof of knowledge, the statement and witness are essentially rigid objects that are just given as inputs to the various parties. And essentially, the underlying assumption is that if that should not be true, then obviously we can first um, run some kind of negotiation protocol where we um, negotiate first on, let's say, the statement and then we run the general proof of knowledge. However, it has been observed that there arise non-trivial aspects if you consider such a negotiation phase. First, on the more practical side, um, if you have a very involved negotiation phase that requires um, the prover already to do a lot of work and then maybe we can get away later with a more efficient protocol rather than a general proof of knowledge while still having the verifier convinced that the proof must know a given witness. Then on a more um, theoretical point of view, there might also be non-trivial um, interactions with respect to security guarantees. Maybe as a fairly naive example, let's say you have a zero knowledge proof of knowledge, but then throughout this negotiation phase, the prover actually really reveals their full um, witness. Then obviously the proof of knowledge being zero knowledge is of no use. So it seems like in the end, we really want that the combined protocol is zero knowledge and not just the proof phase. So to remedy this problem, Kamenich et al. in 2009 actually introduced a generalized proof of knowledge notion that reflects this two-stage process where in the first stage, 
parties negotiate the statement and then there is a second phase where they prove the actual knowledge of a witness. Second, the standard proof of knowledge notion does not consider setup. Again, however, having both prover and verifier access to setup might lead to non-trivial um, effects on many of the fundamental concepts of a proof of knowledge, for instance, on the notion of rebinding as part of the soundness game. Indeed, in prior work, Bernard et al. considered proof of knowledge in the random oracle model, and in more recent work, Chudry et al. considered proof of knowledge um, in the blockchain setting where all the parties are assumed to have access to a public blockchain ledger. And in particular, in their work, they assumed that the extractor cannot rewind um, this public lecture, which obviously then leads to many um, non-trivial effects that might not be reflected in a standard proof of knowledge, where the extractor is always assumed to be able to rewind um, the entire world, essentially. Then third, also the standard proof of knowledge notion considers the um, proof relation to be static and fixed. So that means that for a proof of knowledge protocol, first you assume that the relation is fixed and then you design a specific protocol for that fixed relation. And it has been observed very early on by, um, for instance, Wikström, but also Damgard et al, that in many cases, this might be too limiting and they put forward um, the so-called notion of Relation generators, that is essentially an algorithm that first generates the relation and then outputs um, an explicit description of this relation to all the parties. So um, a given protocol does not just have to work for one specific relation, but for some kind of probabilistic relation generation mechanism. However, it's worth noting that in this generalization, the relation is still um, assumed to be a true relation that is some kind of um, circuit. And in particular, this relation cannot depend on general dynamic setup. So for instance, um, if, you, if your relation depends on some kind of hashing and you need to model this hashing as a random oracle, you're still out of luck. Additionally, it's still assumed that this relation is public and everybody in the world can evaluate it once it has been generated. So to summarize, there has been quite a number of potential generalization identified and with work um, tackling those. However, each of the work so far essentially tackled a single generalization of a proof of knowledge. And in our work, we're the first one that tackle all of the generalization at the same time. In particular, we're the first one that consider um, a general setup rather than just one type of specific setup. And we're the first one to consider a proof relation that depends on the setup. A bit more concretely, we in, in our work, we introduce a generalized notion of proof of knowledge that encompasses both dynamic setup and and relation as well as this interactive two-phase process where one first agrees on the statement and then actually runs the proof. We call our notion agree on proof and we observe that it actually unifies all the existing proof of knowledge generalization and our notion comes with clear semantics of correctness, soundness and obviously zero knowledge. So to demonstrate the usefulness of our notion as a definitional framework for higher level applications that have some kind of proof of knowledge flavor to them, 
We then go on and show two applications. First, we considered proof of ownerships, and second, we consider two-factor entity authentication. I would also like to mention that in recent work, Vitik and Zhang also used um, our proof of our agree and proof notion in their work at Eurogroup this year. With that being said, now let's actually introduce our agree and proof notion. An agree and proof protocol is essentially a four tuple of protocols where both the prover and the verifier are split into two phases. In the first phase, the so-called agreement phase, the first prover interacts with the first verifier and at the end of the phase, they both output a statement X as well as a state for the second phase. In the second phase, the proof phase, then they use the state um, to execute the actual proof and the phase ends with both parties outputting a bit indicating whether the proof has been successful or not. Now, as already mentioned, we want this to happen in the presence of a generalized setup function f. So in our notion, all the four protocols have Oracle access to such a general setup functionality f. Moreover, there's also um, a so-called input generation algorithm i that beforehand interacts with the setup functionality and generates auxiliary input for both the prover and the verifier. Um, it's, it's worth notion, mentioning that the input generation algorithm is not part of a protocol, but rather a protocol has to work for any input gener generation algorithm I. So essentially anything you want to make an assumption on, you should model as part of the setup functionality F, whereas any part of the prior knowledge or the state of the system you don't want to make an assumption on, you can model as part of the input generation algorithm I. Then I should mention that the setup functionality is really some kind of general UC-like functionality that is a stateful probabilistic ITM. In particular, when making a query, a party actually provides two arguments, the first one indicating who they are. So the setup functionality knows whether they're interacting with the prover, the verifier, or the input generation and can um, provide different interfaces to each of them. So we cannot just model something like um, a random oracle or a CRS that is the same for all the parties, but also more involved setup functionality where maybe the verifier gets additional information compared to the prover or different information or so on. Okay, let us now consider briefly the correctness game. Um, in correctness, when an honest prover interacts with an honest verifier, we obviously want that they agree on the statement they want to run the proof on. Additionally, we also introduce um, a general agreement condition C that specifies whether a given statement is valid given the state of the system, such as the auxiliary inputs, as well as the setup functionality. This is mainly there so that somebody who wants to use our framework can rule out trivial protocols in which um, the protocol would always agree on some kind of dummy statement for which um, the proof becomes very easy or even trivial. In particular, we assume that there is some kind of special statement abort. That means they could, prover and verifier could not agree on a statement for which they can run the proof. For instance, in the password-based authentication example, 
if the prover is not given a valid, uh, not given a password, but only some garbage as auxiliary input, then they might decide to abort. On the other hand, if the prover is actually given a valid password, then a correct protocol should have should succeed and not abort. So, in case um, the the statement is not abort, then a correct protocol must actually end with the second phase, both um, outputting that the protocol succeeded. And I should mention here that the prover also outputting um, the, the result is mainly done for so that we know that they both agree on what the outcome was. And worst case, this can always be achieved at the expense of an additional round of communication. Okay, let's now look at the more interesting experiment, which is soundness, which we formalize as an extraction game analogous to standard proof of knowledge. So analogous to standard proof of knowledge, there's a proof relation R and the only difference is really that for us R is not actually a relation but a stateless um, deterministic algorithm that has oracle access to the setup functionality. This really gives us a lot of flexibility because now the goal of a proof of knowledge can be phrased depending on the setup functionality F. So in this extraction game, however, the agreement phase is run exactly once. And so the agreement phase determines a statement X and only after this is done, the extractor comes in and has to extract a witness for that statement X from the second phase prover. This is really important because otherwise um, the extractor might try to rewind the first phase of the protocol until they result in a statement for which um, maybe extraction of a valid witness is much easier, something like this. Here we really want that if the verifier, the honest verifier at the end of phase one thinks we're running um, the proof for a given statement X and afterwards this proof succeeds, then the prover must have known a witness that for that particular X and not some arbitrary X. So in the extraction game, unless the statement is abort, then the extractor has to extract a witness for that statement X and it in addition to just to black box rewinding access to the second phase prover, we also provide the extractor with access to the communication transcript of the first phase as well as all the setup queries the first phase prover made. This is really needed if we want to have this aspect that maybe a very involved um, Agreement phase can lead to a more efficient proof phase. So let's say in the agreement phase, the prover actually send our the witness in order to communicate the statement for whatever reason, then now the proof is trivial and so is the extraction. In addition, the extractor also gets um, Oracle access to the setup functionality, but here only in the role of the prover, obviously, because just because the verifier can query something from the setup functionality doesn't mean that the prover knew this value because we have this possibility that prover and the verifier have different views on the setup functionality. Finally, because the proof relation is no longer a public object, we also have to give the extractor black box access to the proof relation so that, for instance, in a standard extraction, the, the extractor knows whether they need to repeat, to, to rewind once more, or whether they're done. So maybe even, so maybe even if the prover themselves does not necessarily know whether 
Um, a witness is valid. In most cases, the extractor still seems to need to know. And obviously, you can tweak our notion by saying that the extractor should not get access to this and, and stuff like this. And yeah, there, there are a lot of different variants, but I think what we put forward makes sense for most applications. But obviously, feel free to tweak. So this um, finalizes the two main experiments. And I really encourage for you for the formal definition to look at the actual paper that's available either on ePrint or in the conference proceeding. In addition, we also consider some additional properties, mainly zero knowledge. And for zero, zero knowledge, we actually consider two experiments that formalize both Brewer and Verifier zero knowledge, which is really in contrast to standard proof of knowledge. But the difference here is really that in standard proof of knowledge, the verifier does not have any secrets. All the verifier knows is essentially the statement and the auxiliary inputs that the proof knows anyway. So there's no need to formalize that the a dishonest proof does not learn in secret from the verifier. However, in our setting where we have a setup functionality where the verifier might have different access than the prover. We also want to formalize that the dishonest prover does not know learn additional information from about this information. So for instance, in password-based authentication, the, the verifier might have access to the entire password database, but the prover does not. So obviously we want to be able to formalize that during the protocol, the verifier does not leak information about other users' passwords to a dishonest prover. And to make our notion more general, we actually do not just formalize zero knowledge, but we formalize proof of we formalize zero knowledge with explicit leakage. So even if you have a, a protocol or situation where perfect zero knowledge is not achievable, but you have maybe some kind of explicit leakage or bounded leakage, um, our notion has you covered by allowing you to specify an explicit leakage oracle that the simulator then can invoke in order to learn certain well-defined information about the other parties secret inputs, that is the other party's auxiliary input, as well as view on the setup functionality. Additionally, we consider also a programmable variant of our notion where the setup is programmable. For instance, if you have a common reference string, a CRS, then most of the time this is only really useful if you assume that in the soundness game, the extractor can actually program the CRS such that they know the trapdoor. We formalize this by saying that there can be a trapdoor setup functionality for which the extractor learns the trapdoor, but to anybody who does not know the trapdoor, it still looks indistinguishable from the actual setup functionality that we assume to be present in the real world. Finally, let me also briefly touch um, the issue of composability. Uh, so in our paper, we prove actually two results. And both of the results are about um, a higher level protocol invoking an agree and proof um, protocol multiple times in sequence. And what our results show is that one invocation of the agree and proof protocol does not negatively affect the security of any of the other invocations. And one of the results is about all the all the invocation all the all the protocols using the same setup functionality, whereas the other is all the is about all the instances using their own private setup functionality. 
And I should maybe stress that while this might sound like the sequential composition theorem, you know, from proof of knowledge, it's really quite different in spirit. So in the way I understand it in regular proof of knowledge, the composability notion is really mainly a technical tool that's used to say that if you have a proof of knowledge protocol with a big soundness error, you can just repeat it and get the knowledge error down without negatively affecting um, the zero knowledge property or the correctness or anything of that. But there, the point is really that sequentially iterating a proof of knowledge protocol results in a proof of knowledge protocol that's just better but less efficient. On the other hand, sequentially repeating an agree and proof protocol is not really agree and proof protocol anymore because each of the iteration might even agree on a di completely different statement for which you then invoke the proof. So. The way I see it, our protocol is really more of a UC style composability result that says that our notion is strong enough so that you can use it securely. Okay, so that concludes the second part of the presentation, introducing the agree and proof notion and its properties. As a third part, let us briefly look at some of the application. And first, we consider client-side file data application. So, in client-side file data application, you have a server that stores a bunch of files and the client approaching it, trying to convince the server that they already know the content of one of those files. This is in particular useful if you think of maybe a hundred users that all have the same file locally stored and want to outsource it to the same cloud storage provider. So rather than each of the user uploading the file individually and then maybe the server doing some kind of server side deduplication to reduce storage, we can get something more efficiently by only the first user actually uploading the file, whereas all the other users can just run this um, more efficient protocol. But obviously this protocol must be secure in the sense that a user that does not know um, a file cannot trick a server into making the server believe that he knew it and then handing it out the secret file to the client. Indeed, this application, this is something that cloud storage providers are actually interested in and some of them even um, have deployed in practice. Unfortunately, it turned out that many of those protocols are quite insecure in various subtle or less subtle manners. This provided Halevi et al. in 2011 to actually formalize this task as what we nowadays call a proof of ownership. However, despite this proof of ownership sounding like a proof of knowledge, they could not just say it's a specific instance of a proof of knowledge, but rather had to come up with an entirely new security definition, which in their case ended up to be entropy based. So they're not, the notion talks about all the files having high min entropy and then security is defined only for such file and so on. In our work, in contrast, we show that proof of ownership really can just be formalized as an instantiation of our general agree and proof framework. That is, we show that we can provide a specific set of functionality that formalizes this file database, the server stores. We can formalize um, a correctness relation that, that defines that a uh, user that knows such a file must succeed. And we can formalize a, a proof relation that formalizes that only a user that knows a file must succeed. 
In particular, we can then um, also look at the zero knowledge definition with leakage that we have, and we use that to show the security of a novel protocol we, we introduce, which is essentially the privacy preserving analogon of the well known Merkle tree based proof of ownership protocol. So, this Merkle tree protocol, the standard version of it, is not zero knowledge. We then make it almost zero knowledge, but with some explicit leakage. In particular, the, to give you maybe some example, the leakage that a uh, dishonest prover might get is essentially whether the server already has this file stored or not. And we believe that in the context of client-side file application, this is not really an issue because this seems something a user inherently has to learn if you want to have efficient protocols where if the server already stores the, the file, we can skip uploading it. But on the other hand, if the server does not know that file yet, then the, server, the user obviously has to upload the file. As a second application, we consider um, two-factor client authentication. That is a client that wants to log into some server using both a password as well as some kind of second factor, which in our case we model as an abstract hardware token. And again, we formalize this by just instantiating the setup functionality, correctness relation, and proof relation of our framework. And here I would really like to stress that this is something that none of the existing generalization could have done because this, those relations really depend inherently on the setup functionality which in this case is the password database that stores usernames as well as some kind of digest of the user's passwords. But given that obviously users should be allowed to change their passwords, new users should be allowed to, to join the systems and so on, this is really something dynamic that the protocol cannot just assume to and hard code. Moreover, inherently, we do not want that the prover can um, evaluate the proof relation themselves because that would mean that anybody can do offline um, brute force attacks towards this system. Finally, um, this example also shows that our agree and proof formalization actually can not only do proof of knowledge type of stuff, but also can handle this kind of hardware token proof that is not really a proof of knowledge because there's nothing to extract, but it's rather some kind of proof of ability where a prover demonstrates that they have access to something physical, which in our case, we model of having specific access to the setup functionality. To wrap up this talk, we first revisited um, proof of knowledge and we've seen that there already existed many generalization. However, each of those sort of tackled a specific aspect where proof of knowledge were not very general so far. In this work, we present the first proof of knowledge generalization that unifies all of those aspects, namely fully dynamic setup, dynamic and setup dependent relations, and third, dynamic and setup dependent statement negotiation with an explicit agreement phase. Finally, we showed that our um, notion is indeed useful for formalizing proof of knowledge type higher level security goals by giving those two examples. But of course, we believe that our general framework can be of use for also many different examples and we leave it up to you to come up with new exciting applications and maybe would 
love to hear feedback on whether you found our notion to be useful or whether you had to maybe slightly tweak it and so on. With this, I thank you for your attention.